it's my uh, pleasure to welcome everybody uh, very warmly to the 2016 annual Sowerby Lecture uh, in the subject area of philosophy and medicine. If I can introduce myself briefly, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Robert Lecker, I'm the Vice Principal, Vice President, I think is my new title, in charge of the health faculties at King's College London. Um, and uh, Sherry has invited me to sort of chair proceedings which I'm delighted to do. Um, the notion of looking at the interface between philosophy and medicine has been alive at King's for some years, and uh, I'm very supportive of that. I spent most of my uh, professional life at Imperial College. Imperial is a Philistine institution, uh, and uh, it's a great institution, actually. But King's, one of the reasons I was delighted to move to King's was that the arts and humanities and social sciences are so vibrant here, and uh, there's an opportunity to do uh, this kind of interface stuff, um, which is very, very important. Because, of course, uh, philosophy and medicine have a great deal of uh, uh, interests in common, uh, matters of life and death, body and the mind, knowledge and judgment. Uh, my own field, which uh, is transplantation, organ transplantation and immune tolerance, all sorts of interesting questions, like who, who owns your kidney after you die? Um, who has the right to decide what happens to it? Um, so it's a very fertile field, and I'm delighted that uh, we're um, developing this interface um, so fully and richly at King's. Um, and it's made possible by uh, the Peter Sowerby Foundation. Peter Sowerby, for those of you who don't know, was um, a very visionary and entrepreneurial GP um, who was very committed to uh, medics engaging with uh, these issues and engaging with professional uh, philosophers to uh, enrich and gain insights. And um, so I'm now going to hand over to uh, Professor Sherry Rausch, um, who is the uh, Peter Sowerby Professor of um, uh, Philosophy and Medicine, and we were delighted to recruit Sherry from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, uh, just about a year ago or so, two years ago, uh, she came to join uh, King's, and uh, she's now going to uh, award the Sowerby Essay Prize. Thank you all for coming. So, just to introduce you to what the question was in, for this essay prize, even if increasing our life expectancy is not the primary aim of medicine, as a matter of fact, it's actually contributing to achieving this. So a big question lurks behind this trend, which is whether it would be good to keep on extending our lives forever. We typically respond to this by saying, oh, only if we could be healthy and active, right? But let's throw that in and assume that you would be healthy and active. The question still remains, would it be good? So um, the scenario we were entertaining was um, that you're healthy in body and brain, and you're like a person is at, say, the age of 30. And the, uh, the question for the essay was, would it be worth it to continue this indefinitely? The committee of judges was impressed with the quality of the ex essays we got. I will say that marking essays is not always like reading a page turner novel. But this kind of was. You wanted to um, get back and read the next one. Um, the essays were interesting and thoughtful, and quite a few were excellent. It was so hard to choose among them that in the last step, we actually gave up and decided to split the prize between two people. One of our winning authors argued, as the majority did, that no, it wouldn't be worth it for most of us. This author considered the psychology of current human beings and the fact that deadlines and our lack of autonomy in choosing them give us motivation both to do things and finishing, finish things and sometimes to do more important things first. If we lived indefinitely, we wouldn't have the ultimate deadline of death and many things could be put off. We might genuinely regard them as important, but we'd also know, for some things at least, that we could do them later. For those people who procrastinate with the deadlines we already have, how much worse would it be if we were immortal? So if the attraction of living indefinitely is to do more things, then living indefinitely could ironically undermine your goal. Much has been made of the idea that living forever would make us bored. 
this author rather thinks that this impairment of our motivation would make us apathetic, that is, lacking in desires. Over time, this would accumulate and become clinical depression. So the coup de grace here, she says, it might not be possible for us to be both immortal and healthy. The author of this essay is an alumna of the philosophy M. Phil Studd program at King's and currently studying philosophy at Oxford. She is Solani de Souza. And she is with us tonight. Where, where are you? You are. You were. You, wa you once were. You are. <laughs> Our next author was very much in the minority in arguing that, yes, it would be worth it for us to live indefinitely, as long as it didn't mean that we were indestructible. He points out that the problem we have with living longer is the process of decline, the loss of mental and physical abilities, in a word, aging. Aging is bad. Hallelujah. Uh, if we're healthy, as is assumed in the question, then more living is better, other things equal. You might say that other things aren't equal. Aging has benefits, for example, the knowledge and wisdom that comes from experience. But, our author says, if wisdom comes when it does from greater accumulated experience, then immortals would have more of it. If it comes from grappling with decrepitude and the prospect of death, then that's what the wisdom is also good for, and immortals wouldn't need it. So having more experience has benefits, but he says, becoming more decrepit does not. Not only is aging bad, death is prima facie bad, but it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to explain that idea in a way that makes sense. So who is it bad for? The person isn't there anymore, so it can't be bad for him. But the author puts the idea that death is bad in this way. Compare two possible futures John might have. One has him living to time t, the other living to time t plus n. If living is good, that is, we assume some degree of pleasure and interest, then more of it is better. So death is bad because it shortens something that is good. But that argument assumes that life has some pleasure and interest. So now we're back to the question, uh, wouldn't we get bored with all of this time on our hands? Maybe so, but maybe not, says the author. And the kind of immortality described allows us the option of dying. So the value of the immortality on offer is that we have control over whether we die at all. If life is good, we get to keep it. If it's not, then we're not forced to endure it forever. The author of this winning essay is an alumnus of the BA philosophy program at King's, and now studying philosophy at Oxford. He is? Jonas Haig. Are you here? Yes, you are here. So the de philosophy department seems to be on a roll here. Last year's winner was an MBBS student. Um, so we have a kind of inter-school rivalry. One more announcement to, uh, before we get to the lecture. We have this is the last event of this semester, but we start again next semester with a talk from philosopher Nancy Cartwright called What's Wrong with Pragmatic Trials? And that's um, Thursday, January 26th. You can find it on our website, philosophyandmedicine.org. Thank you very much, um, Sherry. So uh, my, my next task is to introduce the speaker, but one thing I forgot to say when talking about this initiative uh, philosophy and medicine, and that is an innovation um, in the new medical curriculum for uh, all undergraduate medical students that all of them will be taught some philosophy. Uh, and I don't know how many other medical schools have done that, but I think it's terrific. And uh, we'll see uh, how that goes down with the students. So, uh, to the main event, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce to you uh, Dr. Jacob Stegenga, uh, who is from the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Jacob is a philosopher of science with a focus on philosophy of medicine and biology. 
and his research employs conceptual analysis, empirical findings, historical inquiry, and formal methods to establish normative conclusions about science. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for that uh, introduction, and I would like to thank the philosophy and medicine program here at KCL uh, for this invitation, and uh, thank you for expressing interest in my work. Uh, by way of thanks, I wish that I had a more sort of cheery message to share with you tonight, but uh, the subject of my talk is medical nihilism. So many of us are familiar with headlines like the following headlines that represent a great amount of uncertainty in medical research, uh, headlines that represent um, findings, empirical findings that suggest medical interventions are far less effective that, than we had once thought and hoped. These headlines are representing uncertainty in medicine, empirical findings that suggest uh, medical interventions are far less effective than once thought. And in some cases, these headlines are representing uh, cases of biased medical research, and in the worst cases, fraud. It's not just journalists that are contributing to this sort of genre. So here's a bunch of titles written by physicians and epidemiologists or well-placed academics um, who are articulating various forms of skepticism about present-day medicine. The titles on the left, Selling Sickness or The Loss of Sadness, these critics are worried about what they take to be spurious disease categories, disease categories constructed with, for the purpose of selling more drugs rather than benefiting patients. These are diseases like premenstrual dysphoric disorder or female sexual dysfunction or suburban sadness. The titles in the middle are worried about medical interventions that appear less effective than we should hope and than we once thought, drugs like SSRIs. And the titles on the right are concerned with what these critics take to be a nefarious influence of industry on medical research. My personal favorite title in this genre is this one here, Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime. Now, these aren't, these aren't cranky outsiders. So th these authors are among the most prominent physicians and epidemiologists in the world today. So Marsha Angel, for example, is the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Peter Gotcha is Europe's most important epidemiologist today. John Ioannidis is one of the world's most important epidemiologists. This article, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, is now notorious and infamous, published in one of the most important medical journals, the most downloaded article from that journal. And in this article and many others like it, Ioannidis is performing second order empirical research on first order clinical research. And he's painting a very bleak picture about the state of medical science today. Of course, Ben Goldacre's uh, uh, well known for being critical of uh, industry-funded um, clinical science. So his most recent book is titled Bad Pharma, and from that book he, he extracted a, a kind of a long essay published in The Guardian a couple of years ago titled simply, The Drugs Don't Work. Now, these authors are all articulating various arguments that taken together, support a sort of general skepticism about contemporary medical research, a position that I'm calling medical nihilism, which is the view that we ought to have little confidence in the effectiveness of medical interventions. So I've made it my business to assess how plausible these arguments are. Sometimes they're very, very, um, they're put in quite strong terms. So here, for instance, is the current editor of The Lancet, who writes, afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, 
invalid exploratory analyses, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. These are grand claims. Now, of course, they're worrying claims, and so I've made it my job in the last few years to assess how compelling these sorts of arguments are. And unfortunately, I think on the whole, these arguments are fairly compelling. Now, I've been working for the last few years on a book to articulate the arguments for medical nihilism. So tonight, I'm going to sort of paint with broad strokes the big picture argument for um, medical nihilism. And I'll just have time to dive in very briefly into the particular arguments that support the premises in the overall argument. But before starting, I want to note that, of course, medical nihilism is a very old view. So it's easy to find expressions of medical nihilism throughout history. Um, even Hippocrates, you know, the symbolic grandfather of medicine, has many expressions that are at least attributed to him that seem very skeptical of, of medicine of his day. And of course, in the early modern period, one can find many expressions of medical nihilism from playwrights and poets and academics, various essayists. And through the 19th century, um, there's many, many expressions of medical nihilism. This uh, picture is a wood etching by Goya in 1799. The picture is depicting uh, a physician as a donkey asking, I wonder what this person's going to die from. Um, and uh, commentators on this, um, on this uh, woodcut claim, actually, they, they argue that the person's already dead. So, um, <laughs> now, I, I like this, I like this uh, woodcut for, for a, cu a couple of reasons. One is you know, it's expressing this sort of skepticism at this really interesting moment in history. Goya is often um, thought to be this kind of transitional artist from the sort of early modern or, or Renaissance artists um, linking this sort of enlightenment movement in art to the romanticism that came in the 19th century. And again, one can find expressions of medical nihilism throughout this time. I, I don't like this uh, woodcut f because it focuses on um, physicians as being uh, the problem. And in the arguments that about in the arguments that favor medical nihilism that I'm sympathetic to, um, the arguments focus on the interventions that physicians have at their disposal and the context in which these interventions are studied and not the competence of physicians themselves. Here, for example, is a passage from Dryden who writes, better to hunt in fields for health unbought than fee the doctor for a nauseous draught. The wise for cure on exercise depend God never made his work for man to mend. So lived our sires. Here, doctors learned to kill and multiplied with theirs the weekly bill. <laughs> so we see, we see in this passage three common themes that medical nihilists have long expressed and that the books that I just had up on the screen a few moments ago are expressing. So these themes are, one, the untreatability of many diseases. God never made his work for man to mend. And second is the ineffectiveness of many medical interventions. So interventions are just nauseous. You might as well just go for a hike in the fields. And the third is the corrupting financial, uh, the corrupting influence of financial incentives on medicine. This is in 1700. In the middle of the 19th century, uh, the dean of the Harvard Medi Medical School had this to say. If the whole materia medica, if, if all of our drugs could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> now, by the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, there were many really important advances in medical science and medical practice. So we had the, the rise of germ theory, uh, early vaccines, um, by the 1920s and 1930s, the first antibiotics were being developed. Um, in the 1920s, Banting and Best in Toronto discovered that the causal basis of type 1 diabetes was a deficiency of insulin and that you could just administer exogenous ins insulin and save lives. So there was this 
golden age of medical discovery, say roughly from 1900 to about 1950, with antibiotics, vaccines, insulin. And so you don't find a lot of expressions like this. You don't find many expressions of medical nihilism in 1950. There were just so many wonderful medical advances in the preceding decades. But by the 1960s and 1970s, one starts to see medical nihilism appear again, and it's often associated with movements like anti-institutionalism or anti-capitalism. Um, there was a prominent movement, the anti-psychiatry movement, associated with people like R.D. Lang and Michel Foucault. This, this was a kind of trendy thing in the 1960s and 1970s. But arguably in the last, say, two generations or so, medical nihilism sort of fell by the wayside. But in the last five or 10 years, we start to see those titles that I had up on the screen a few moments ago. So I'm interested in this resurgence of medical nihilism in the last five or 10 years. It's one thing to be a skeptic about medicine in 1700. It's a, an entirely different thing to be a, a skeptic about medicine in the 21st century. Another thing to note before diving into the argument is that, of course, medical nihilism contrasts quite sharply with medical practice today. So this is a graph displaying um, the um, use of prescription drugs over the last several decades in the United States by almost any metric. Um, number of prescriptions written, number of patients on multiple prescriptions, um, number of dollars spent on pharmaceuticals, profitability of the pharmaceutical industry, by, only, by almost any metric. It appears that our confidence in the effectiveness of medical interventions is unbridled. Okay, philosophers have a fetish for formalisms, and I'm gonna share um, my fetish for formalisms with you tonight. Nothing much hangs on my use of this particular formal apparatus. I just find it a handy way of summarizing a disparate set of arguments into a unified whole. So suppose we have a hypothesis about the effectiveness of a medical intervention. We'll just call it H. And H just says, this drug is effective. And we have evidence about that drug, E. We'll just call E the publicly available evidence for H. We can represent our confidence in the drug, our confidence that that hypothesis is true by what's called a conditional probability. The probability that H is true given E. So this term just represents our confidence in the medical intervention, our confidence that this drug is indeed effective now that we've got evidence for that drug. Now this is handy because this is what's called a conditional probability and we can import a bit of math very simple bit of math called Bayes' theorem, which allows us to re-represent this term as follows, and you're just gonna have to take my word for this. Um, the, the math behind this is very trivial, but, but very useful. And this is not my innovation, of course. Um, this is a device that's handed down to us by mathematicians for a long time. Philosophers like to appeal to Bayes' theorem to represent scientific inference um, as follows. So the conditional probability on the, on the left is equivalent to the term on the right. This term is called the likelihood. This term is called the prior probability of the hypothesis. And this is the probability of the evidence. Now, here's the general master argument for medical nihilism put in extremely abstract terms. And once I put it in abstract terms, I'm going to unpack it with some concrete detail. So, very, very abstractly, the argument for medical nihilism is that this term, the so-called likelihood, is low. This term, the prior probability of the hypothesis, is low. And this term, 
the probability of the evidence is high. Three premises and one conclusion, this term, the term that represents our confidence in H, is very low. So it's clearly a deductive, valid argument because there are just three premises and a conclusion. And of course, the question is, is it sound? Are the premises true? Well, I spend 12 chapters in a book defending those premises, <laughs> and in the next 20 or 25 minutes, I'm going to give you an idea of what those arguments look like. So in a nutshell, the remainder of the talk is going to follow this structure where I just spend a few minutes talking about the arguments for this, a few minutes uh, talking about the arguments for this, and a few minutes talking about the arguments for this. So in brief, the so-called likelihood, this is low because of a widespread empirical phenomena in clinical science today, namely effect sizes are small. So our, our very best clinical trials and meta-analyses suggest tiny effect sizes. This term is low because of what I'm calling a dearth of magic bullets. Drugs like penicillin for bacterial infections or exogenous insulin for type 1 diabetes. These are these kind of miracle drugs that target with high specificity and high potency the causal basis of diseases. And unfortunately, we have very few of these. And this term, the probability of the evidence is high because most clinical science today suffers from systematic bias. So again, this is the master argument, three premises and a conclusion, and I'll just unpack each of these premises briefly now. I'll start with this term. Why is this term high? This term is high because a, a great amount of medical research today is biased. I'll put, I'll put the argument, but I'll just step back for one second and put this argument in terms of the subtitle for tonight's talk. So the subtitle was, should we trust medical research? And I want to offer you three different answers for that question. Okay, so we'll go back to the master argument. The three different answers are no, yes, and yes. Okay? So about 80% of clinical research today is funded by um, private industry and suffers from a great number of methodological biases and we ought not trust it. Some medical research today is funded by large organizations like the NIH or the IMH, um, performed by independent academic scientists. Some meta-analyses get access to both published data and unpublished data. Those trials and meta-analyses, those are the ones that we should trust. And those trials and meta-analyses show that, on, on average, show that our medical interventions today have tiny effect sizes. Finally, the bench science that many, um, many scientists are employed in to motivate or to, to discover the pathophysiological basis of disease and the mechanisms by which exogenous interventions can intervene on pathophysiology, that sort of science it doesn't suffer from the same sorts of biases that industry-funded clinical science suffers from, and so we ought to trust it. And what we learn from that sort of science is we have few magic bullets. So should we trust medical research? No, yes, and yes. <laughs> That's the punchline. Clinical science today uh, stacks the deck in favor of medical interventions under study. There are numerous deck stacking strategies I'm going to describe a few of them. I'll describe these four briefly. Clinical trials employ biased measuring instruments, biased subject recruitment, uh, a practice called p-hacking, and a widespread phenomenon known as publication bias. So first, what do I mean by biased measuring instruments? I'm just going to describe this with an example. The example is the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression. This is a 20-question survey used in 
clinical research on the effectiveness of antidepressants. Each question gets three or four, there's three or four possible answers, each with its uh, certain number of points. The total number of points is around 50. The idea is you want subjects in the intervention group, uh, the, say, experimental SSRI group, you want their HAMD score to go down more than um, the HAMD score uh, uh, decrease of patients in the placebo group. So the HAMD score, when all the points are summed, is supposed to be a measure of the severity of depression of research subjects. Here's the first page. That's probably too small for you to read, so I'll just zoom in a little bit. So there are a few questions about insomnia. Insomnia at the early stage of, of sleep, insomnia in the middle stage of sleep. There are a few questions about whether or not subjects enjoy their work and their activities. Um, a question about agitation, whether or not the subject is fidgety or playing with hands, can't sit still. Um, whether or not the subject is anxious, like worrying about minor matters or irritable, you know, the sorts of things that speakers, when they're speaking in front of 100 people sometimes, you know, display. <laughs> Um, nail biting, lip chewing, or if you're a graduate student in philosophy, you might be familiar with some of these sorts of tendencies. There's an interesting question on the HAMD scale uh, on insight, the extent to which a research subject has insight into their own illness. Here's the question. A subject gets zero points if they acknowledge being depressed and ill, one point if they acknowledge their illness but attribute the cause to something external like bad food, two points if they deny being ill at all. Now this is twisted and perverse for a couple of reasons. The first and sort of simple reason why this is uh, twisted and perverse is that you know, if you're a, like a rugged cowboy or a philosophical critic, you might just be guaranteed to get two points. But worse is that if you're a subject in a trial on antidepressants and you start the trial by denying being ill because you, in fact, aren't ill, and end the trial by acknowledging being ill because you, in fact, are ill, <laughs> then your HAMD score goes down two points on this question. So the general problem with the HAMD scale is that it's nonspecific with respect to core features of depression the content validity of HAMD is very low. So, for instance, I showed you three, points on, uh, three questions on insomnia for a total of six possible points, or four possible points from fidgeting. So you can imagine a sedative, which just makes you sleep better or fidget less, and your HAMD score can go down by 10 points. And to put that in context, Recent NICE guidelines have held that an intervention that decreases your HAMD score by three points is deemed an effective antidepressant. So the scale itself contributes to overestimating the effectiveness of the intervention under investigation. Now, recently, in the evidence-based medicine community and the philosophy of medicine community, there's been a lot of debate about the relative merits of randomized control trials uh, compared to, say, non-randomized studies. Most of this debate has been focused on the role of randomization itself, the role of randomization per se. But this sort of problem, this problem with biased measuring instruments, shows that you can have a perfectly well-done randomized control trial with no with perfect balance of potential confounding factors between experimental group and control group. The subjects could be blinded to whatever intervention they're getting. The, the treating physicians could be blinded to what, the, what group the subjects are randomized to. But if the trial em employs a measuring instrument which itself is biased, then the results from your RCT are biased. Now, you might think that that's just a problem of a poorly validated psychometric scale, and um, so that doesn't apply to, um, you know, trials where there's a hard endpoint like death, say. 
Um, that would be hasty. Um, there are other sorts of measurement problems, even with, binary out even with hard binary outcomes. So one measuring problem, for instance, is the, f the sort of statistical measure you use on the data from your trial. 75% of trials report what are called relative outcome measures on, on binary properties, like death. The problem with relative measures, like relative risk reduction, is that they overestimate, they contribute to individuals overestimating the effectiveness of interventions. So there's a good amount of empirical and psychological literature that shows that when you give relative measures to physicians and patients, physicians and patients overestimate effectiveness of interventions. When you give them what are called absolute measures, most importantly the risk difference measure, physicians and patients are better at estimating the true effectiveness of interventions. And that's with hard endpoints like death. Okay, the second deck stacking strategy is by a subject recruitment. So trials have to employ inclusion and exclusion criteria to determine what sorts of subjects can be um, included in the trial in the first place. So these are things like you don't want subjects who are too old, you don't want pregnant women, um, you don't want subjects um, with multiple diseases or on multiple drugs. And there are, of course, good ethical reasons for Im implementing some of these sorts of constraints. One problem that's now widely noted in, in the literature is that those inclusion and exclusion criteria mitigate the so-called external validity of trials because real-world patients are elderly, on multiple drugs, have multiple diseases, and so the results of your trials that employ these inclusion and exclusion criteria are um, less applicable to the real world than you'd otherwise want them to be. And the imp importantly, those properties with which you're excluding subjects, like age, polypha polypharmacy, or comorbidity, we know that those properties modulate the effectiveness of interventions. So we know that old age um, increases the harm profile or increases the harmful side effects of medical interventions, for example. The most egregious of biasing um, strategies in, in this domain are what are called enrichment strategies. So enrichment strategies literally are <laughs> techniques that trial designers use to enrich the subject, the population of subjects in your trial to enhance the apparent effectiveness of interventions. I'll just describe, I'll describe the two most important ones. The, so the, the strategy is as follows. First, you employ the inclusion and exclusion criteria to recruit your subjects. So you've got a, your pool of subjects that you can um, run your trial on. Then you randomly allocate subjects to intervention group and placebo group. At that point, but before you actually start running the trial, at that point, you test the subjects in the placebo group to see how well they do on placebo and you exclude placebo responders for the remainder of the trial, for when you actually start gathering hard data. In the intervention group, you test how well the subjects do on the intervention, and if they do poorly, like they suffer from side effects, say, you exclude them from the trial. At that point, you start running the trial and, and gathering hard data. I hope it's obvious to you that that tactic systematically stacks the deck in favor of interventions under study. These are widely used tactics. Um, not only are they permitted by regulators like the FDA, um, important like, thought leaders in the FDA were um, behind some of the developments of these strategies. Very briefly, p-hacking. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the notion of p-hacking. P-hacking involves the unconstrained analysis of data from trials in the hope of finding statistically significant correlations or statistically sig significant findings and then publishing those findings. 
Now, one way to mitigate things like p-hacking, and the next thing I'll talk about publication bias, is to demand that trials publish in advance their, their plan, their analytic plan. The problem is that something like half of all publications violate their, their pre-trial analytic plans. So we have good reason to think that p-hacking is a widespread phenomenon. Arguably the worst offender of all of the deck stacking strategies is publication bias. A publication bias is something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, journalists like Ben Goldacre have um, made a lot of noise about publication bias. Um, publication bias is the withholding of findings that are unfavorable to uh, a medical intervention and the, the publishing of findings that make your intervention look effective. There have been some second order empirical studies performed that attempt to estimate the frequency of publication bias. I'll describe one really quickly. A German health technology agency looked at all of the interventions that were submitted to this agency for assessment in a one year window and then went to the trial designs of, these, of the interventions in question. So all of the trials that had been performed to test these interventions, and they just counted the number of outcomes that had been stipulated in advance as measured, as to be measured in the trials. And then they went to the corresponding uh, published record so they just looked at all the publications of these trials and counted the number of outcomes for which there was a corresponding publication. And the publication rate of outcomes was something like 23%. So 23% of the measured outcomes in the trials for these interventions that this agency was assessing had been published. So it's a really widespread finding. Uh, in the literature, like, like in the book by Ben Goldacre, for example, he's got all sorts of anecdotes. Um, book by Marsha Angel, same thing. Uh, I assume many of you are aware of this, so I won't dwell on it any longer. Now, why, why do those deck, deck stacking strategies entail that this term is high? Well, ask yourself. If you read a publication of some RCT that that offers some positive evidence that some intervention is effective. You ask yourself, how likely is it that you'd come across this kind of evidence regardless of whether or not the intervention were indeed effective? Well, since we know that these deck stacking strategies are at play, your answer ought to be pretty high. The odds are pretty high that you'll see positive confirming evidence for a medical intervention, regardless of whether or not that intervention is indeed effective. Okay, back to the master argument. The likelihood, the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis. This term is low. It's low for quite different reasons. Um, a, a widespread finding today in clinical science is that interventions appear to have tiny effect sizes. Indeed, many commentators are calling this an effect size crisis. And indeed, this effect size crisis is what's motivating trial designers and regulators to come up with those strategies like the enrichment strategies to try to get bigger effect sizes. Now this is an empirical finding, I can only illustrate it with a bunch of examples. I'll just run through a few of them very briefly. So one example that I've already talked about a little bit are um, antidepressant, the effectiveness of antidepressants as measured by the HAMD scale. Now you've already had a look at what that HAMD scale um, looks like 
the very best meta-analyses that we have on antidepressants are done by scientists that get access to both published and unpublished data. At least they think they are. Um, because publication bias involves um, hiding of data, uh, it, one is not always sure if you've gotten uh, access to all of the available data. But allegedly, scientists are able to get at most or all available data. And on average, the finding of these meta-analyses is that antidepressants decrease your handy uh, score by 1.8 points. And again, to put that in context, recent NICE guidelines have held that antidepressants are effect or interventions um, for de uh, depression are effective if they decrease your HMD score by three points. This is a, a, a recent uh, finding that got headlines about a year ago. Tamoxifen for, if you take tamoxifen for 10 years for early ER positive breast cancer, your mortality goes down by 2.8%. That's, and of course, for ER negative breast and so tamoxifen is, of course, useless. So tamoxifen for 10 years, that's serious. Methylphenidate, a Ritalin, a widely, widely prescribed drug for uh, childhood attention deficit disorder. Um, the recent biggest, longest, best quality trial performed by the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States with long-term follow-up, so follow-up at three years and follow-up at seven years, unlike most um, industry-funded um, studies, which um, last a handful of weeks. So the longest and best study shows that methylphenidate just has no benefit on any patient-level parameter as measured at one year, three years, and seven years. And there are noticeable harms. Statins, this is a famous one. Now, I'm describing these outcomes, of course, at, with a really broad brush. So on average, and, you know, it depends on the patient population that you're testing these in. So statins decrease mortality by 1.2%. If you refine the patient population by um, studying statins in people that have already had a heart attack, the, the effectiveness is um, larger. A drug to increase bone density. Um, if you take this drug for five years, the hope is that increasing bone density will decrease hi uh, hip fractures, decrease the probability of you having hip fracture. So take this bone density increasing drug for five years, your probability of having a hip fracture goes down by 1%. Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, this was the scandalous in Britain a couple of years ago. Uh, our colleagues in Oxford, at the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, did a very large meta-analysis where they again got access to published and unpublished data. They had to fight with industry to get access to that data. And they found uh, that oseltamivir had a kind of trifling effect on flu symptoms. Oncology drugs, um, Dr. Smith, from whom we'll hear uh, in just a few minutes, is on record. Now, it may be, maybe in some jest or maybe not is on record as saying that the best way to treat cancer is with love, morphine, and whiskey. <laughs> uh, maybe, 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 there was, maybe this was said in jest, but you know some of the greatest truths were said in jest. So, small effect sizes. Why do small effect sizes entail that the likelihood is low? Well, again, ask yourself, if the interventions were indeed effective, if your hypothesis was true, then you'd ex you wouldn't expect to see evidence like this. You'd expect to see evidence of larger effect sizes, consistently larger effect sizes. OK, back to the master argument. Why is the prior probability of the hypothesis low? This is for a reason that I'm calling a dearth of magic bullets. This is a, a picture of the chemist Paul Ehrlich and his colleague, Sahachiro Hata. Ehrlich coined the term magic bullet. This was in the early years of the 20th century. Ehrlich and Hata were looking for uh, a treatment for syphilis. The treatment for syphilis at the time was mercury, which was used to treat 2,000 other diseases. And of course, 
um, was ineffective and harmful. And Ehrlich, this is a quote from Ehrlich, we must search for magic bullets, we must strike the parasites, and the parasites only. And to do this, we must learn to aim with chemical substances. So he coined the term chemotherapy and magic bullet. His aim was to find a magic bullet that targeted the causal, the constitutive causal basis of the disease with high potency and high specificity, and he found a magic bullet. So he found one of the first antimicrobial agents. And with this antimicrobial substance, he could cure syphilis. I've al already mentioned a couple of other examples of magic bullets discovered in this era. So insulin for type 1 diabetes was such an example. The legend is that the, like within the week of Banting and Best discovering that exogenous insulin could mitigate the symptoms of, of diabetes in dogs, they just walked over to uh, a pediatric ward for um, diabetic children and just started jabbing kids with insulin, and they just woke up out of their coma. It's truly, truly a, a, a miracle drug. Here's a, a headline from Time, a cover from Time um, a few years ago, uh, saying there, there's new ammunition in the war against cancer. These are the bullets. So we often see this kind of rhetoric of magic bullets or silver bullets in the popular literature today. Um, here's a quote from somebody talking about Prozac. Prozac was a revolution in psychopharmacology because of its selectivity on the serotonin system. It was a drug with the precision of a Scud missile launched miles away from its target only to land with a proud flare right on the enemy's roof. You can, you can guess the nationality of this writer probably. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think that these claims are grossly exaggerated. Um, so Prozac is not a magic bullet. Um, today, medicine lacks magic. Today, the, dis the medical interventions at our disposal aren't like penicillin for, for bacterial infections or insulin for type 1 diabetes. I think that's for a few reasons, and I'm just going to briefly describe these reasons. This, this is a causal model of depression. I'll just zoom in. This is described to us by some of our, our leading research psychiatrists, describing the kind of causal nexus that leads to cases of depression. And you can see that the, the nodes in this causal network themselves are themselves just really complicated things like low social support or low self-esteem or whether or not you've had trauma in your life or whether or not you've ever been divorced. So this is, and just, just, just looking at the sort of causal network, it's kind of baffling. The causal basis of depression is extremely complicated. So I think for that reason, interventions are liable to be ineffective. Intervening on one small node of a complicated causal pathway, especially when that causal pathway can exhibit, say, robustness to external perturbations. Such interventions are bound to be of little effectiveness. Another reason why um, medicine lacks magic today is because of the complex way in which exogenous drugs, ligands, interact with normal physiology. So there's a one-to-many relationship between exogenous drugs and the receptors which those drugs activate. And there's a one-to-many relationship between activated receptors and activated biochemical pathways. And there's a one-to-many relationship between activated biochemical pathways and physiological effects, especially in different tissues. So you can imagine the complex cascading effects throughout normal and pathophysiology, just given a single um, intervention. I think there's also a kind of sociological reason to explain why we have a dearth of magic bullets today. Our regulatory and intellectual property regimes are structured in such a way that so-called me-too drugs 
are incentivized. A MeToo drug is a new member of a class of drugs which is already populated with a bunch of different drugs. So like the latest statin, for example, is a MeToo drug. And for various reasons, I mean, in, uh, pharmaceutical companies know that um, uh, existing um, drugs in, the, in a general class of MeToo drugs are profitable and they'll be approved by regulators. And so there's an incentive to um, work on MeToo drugs. So for a bunch of reasons, when you, when you ask, will this new intervention uh, be effective, for the reasons I've just um, worked through, your answer ought to be probably not. You ought to have a low probability in H. OK, back to the master argument. Three premises and a conclusion. Now, it's an, it's an audacious thesis I'm offering you tonight. And so there are several various objections that are sort of obvious. Um, I, won't, I won't work through these objections or respond to them now, but we can talk about them during Q&A. Uh, I will just say that they're all completely misguided. <laughs> <laughs> okay, medical nihilism suggests changes to clinical practice. I hope that's obvious. The research agenda, the sorts of um, so the sorts of research programs that we think are worth funding and pursuing. Methodological standards. Regulatory standards. And possibly changes to our intellectual property laws. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and we now have uh, the uh, reply uh, from Dr. Richard Smith, um, who was the former editor of the British Medical Journal. Um, Richard qualified in medicine in Edinburgh, worked in hospitals in Scotland and New Zealand uh, before going into medical journalism, joining the BMJ and becoming uh, its editor-in-chief. He's also worked for six years as a television doctor with the BBC and TVAM, has a degree in management science from Stanford, and is the author of the book, The Trouble with Medical Journals, published in 2006. He's also written extensively about the limitations and problems of the peer review process. Richard. Good. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I, I hope you can uh, hear me at the back. I once went to a talk given by Richard Dole, you know, one of the world's most famous epidemiologists, who said, he described how he'd done the same thing, and someone at the back said, um, I can hear you, but I'm quite willing to change places with somebody who can't. <laughs> so I hope none of you feel that by the end of uh, this evening. So I, I think I'm here because I met Jacob at a conference on social epistemology in California where I was speaking. Um, I have to confess I had no idea what social epistemology was, but somehow I, I kind of got through it. And I can't resist saying a little bit about your essay prize, because I think that's a fantastic thing, question to have set. And I'm, I'm very pro-deaf, and I give the arguments for, you know, so you can see that I'm a bit of a nihilist myself, that's how I pronounce it. Um, and part of my talk, I refer to Bernard Williams' essay, The Macropolis Case, um, which is about a woman who lived completely healthily until she was 342, and she was bored absolutely rigid because um, she, she was given a potion every year. And eventually she decided, I just, I just don't want to take this anymore. And in the opera, she ages to 342 years in front of your, your eyes. Uh, so I think that was a very, uh, because I think actually, and it's kind of implicit in what medicine's doing now, that we are in pursuit of immortality. You know, we're going to cure everything. You'll see that Zuckerberg has uh, now given out, you know, three billion to cure everything, um, which is why I think it's so important that we have medical nihilists around. Um, and I have to confess, not only am I a medical nihilist, I have been um, ever since I was a medical student. And I just want to sort of trace the sort of intellectual journey I've been on, because I don't think I was a medical nihilist 
when I went to medical school in Edinburgh in 1970. But when I began to do clinical medicine, I began to have an awful feeling in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh that a lot of what was going on was more for the benefit of the doctors than the patients, which was a very disturbing feeling. And then in um, 1974, I went to a lecture by Ivan Illich, who's referred to in Jacob's book. He was one of the sort of new wave of medical nihilists. He wrote a book called Limits to Medicine or Medical Nemesis. Uh, and his, his argument was that modern medicine is the major threat to health in the world today. And so you can imagine being a medical student and hearing this argument and thinking, well, that's absurd. And then slowly but surely as he spoke, because he was a very charismatic speaker, being absolutely convinced by it. And this was on a Friday afternoon in Edinburgh. The place was absolutely packed because he was very fashionable in those days. And I sort of staggered out afterwards and I dropped out of medical school. I thought, well, this is crazy. Well, I dropped out on the Monday, but by the end of Monday, I couldn't think what else to do. And so on Tuesday, I dropped back in again. <laughs> but it's had a huge influence on me ever since. And there's a wonderful irony in the fact that I should be sort of blown off course as I was and yet I should end up as editor of the BMJ, which is a sort of major establishment figure in, uh, in medicine. Um, and it was when I started at the BMJ in 1979, I wrote a book on alcohol problems and how to respond to them. And as I examined the evidence for what was being advocated, I realised how extraordinarily weak it was. <clears throat> there were no controlled trials, there was no agreement on what exactly an alcoholic was, so actually, you couldn't really make sense of most of this. And I started by assuming, well, that's because it's alcohol and that's an area that's poorly researched. But slowly but surely, I suppose I came to realise that actually there are huge you know, evidence problems throughout medicine. And I was there at the beginning of the whole evidence-based medicine revolution. We created a journal at the BMJ called Evidence-Based Medicine. I met with Dave Sackett. And recently, I, I did a series of videos for JAMA on the oral history of evidence-based medicine. And I think, unfortunately, although that, that emphasised the importance of evidence, it also uh, illustrated, as Jacob has shown wonderfully in this lecture, just how extraordinarily weak a lot of that evidence is. In his book, because he gave me a copy of the introduction, talks about the malleability of RCT systematic reviews and the other methods of medicine. And I think that's, uh, that's a very good way to describe it. I then, as Robert mentioned, I then got into kind of research into peer review, which is in a way the process we use to try and quality assure what we publish in journals. And unfortunately, I concluded, and I've written a lot about this, that actually peer review ironically, as it's at the centre of science, is a faith-based, not an evidence-based uh, intervention. Because when you look at the evidence, we have lots and lots of evidence of the downside. We have very little evidence of the upside. And as Drummond Rennie, deputy editor of JAMA and convener of a whole series of congresses on peer review says, if it were a drug, it would never get onto the market because we've little evidence of benefit and lots of evidence of adverse effects. And then also, I found myself very involved in uh, fraud within medical research. Last year, I spent a day and a half giving evidence in a fraud case in the High Court in Toronto uh, of a man called R.K. Chandra. And in the end, we, the BMJ retracted an article of his that went back to 1989. And I think that almost everything he has done, although he's described as the father of nutritional immunology, is fraudulent, because if you were producing fraudulent papers in 1989, why would you start bothering to produce proper ones? And I've, I've had a battle with another man, R.B. Singh, who's dozens and dozens of trials, none of which have ever been retracted, and yet it's an open secret that they're fraudulent. And then, as Robert referred to, I, I went away to a Venetian palazzo to write a book about medical journals, and rather to my horror, as I looked at all the evidence, I began to realise that there are huge problems, not only publication bias, as Jacob referred to, but all sorts of other problems in the quality of evidence published in medical journals. So I've kind of ended up 
as a, well, I suppose I started off almost as a medical nihilist. But what I want to argue is that actually the best doctors pretty well all, all are medical nihilists. I don't include myself in that. I am a nihilist. I am a doctor, but I'm not a good doctor. But uh, this is sort of all men are Greeks kind of argument, isn't it? Um, and I want to illustrate a quote that I'm sure Robert will know. So good surgeons know how to operate, better surgeons know when to operate, and the best surgeons know when not to operate. And I think that that is generally true of all medicine. And I think good doctors are extremely sceptical of the evidence they're presented with, particularly the evidence by facilitators from drug companies who come to speak to them. Their, their starting priority probability is that I don't think this treatment actually is any better than what I'm already using. That's where they start from, I think, most of them, and they take a lot of convincing otherwise. And I worry that, you know, there is rather a lot of medicine that is out of control. Um, I went last night to a rather brilliant lecture uh, given by Martin Elliott, who's the head cardiothoracic surgeon at Great Ormond Street, and where he talked about his interaction with this man, Paolo Maccarini, who was doing these fraudulent, you know, killing patients, no other word for it, and uh, with these tracheal uh, transplants, he just went straight to doing it in human beings. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't, in I'll get to the point. <laughs> Anyways, and I particularly worry about oncology. I think a lot of oncology, vastly expensive drugs that producing just a, a few extra days or weeks of life. And at a dinner recently, I sat next to an oncologist who said, uh, we have now have to do our clinical trials with stopwatches um, because we're looking at such a small increase in, uh, in life. And I think about the uh, New England Journal of Medicine article published in 2010, which I think illustrates the value of medical nihilism where patients with metastatic lung cancer were either randomized to the usual uh, rather aggressive treatment, this was in the US, or to palliative care. And those that received palliative care had a much higher quality of life in the life that was left to them, far fewer depressive symptoms, and they lived longer. They lived 11.6 versus 8.9 months. And I think that sort of illustrates the value of medical nihilism. So I wanted to say that I, I kind of agree with Jacob's core argument, but I realise now, sitting there, that I got it all slightly garbled. But I think it amounts almost to the same thing. So we should assign a low prior probability that a medical intervention will be effective. Well, there are remarkably few treatments that are highly effective, as Jacob has illustrated, which I think sort of comes as a surprise. And I think it is well recognized among the best epidemiologists, and I'm thinking of Richard Pito. That's why we need these huge big trials to em demonstrate what actually is a very small effect. Uh, there should be a low estimation for the likelihood of that evidence. We know that much of medical evidence is poor, it's poorly done, it's too small, it's biased, it uses poor statistical methods. The Lancet has recently argued that 85% of, uh, <coughs> of medical research is wasted. And we should have a high prior, prior probability of, uh, of that evidence. We know that the higher the quality of evidence, actually as we move from you know, just an open comparison through ever better done randomized trials, we discover that the beneficial effects get smaller and smaller and smaller and often disappear uh, eventually. And also, I think this big problem that we're doing these trials, and Jacob mentioned this, in very uh, defined populations, in ideal circumstances, when we get out there into the real world, uh, we discover that these things are not nearly as effective. I'm almost done. Um, and I think it's very, very important to realize that most of medical care now is not about people with single diseases, which most of our evidence is. It's, as Jacob said, it's about people with multiple conditions. And when you apply the evidence divide, derived from single conditions, actually you can end up doing patients a lot of harm. So although I'm arguing that most doctors are medical nihilists, I think, unfortunately, most 
patients and citizens are not. And I think doctors probably must take some responsibility for this. I think they have a very exaggerated view of the benefits of medicine. And that is affecting us in the sense that more and more and more and more money is being demanded for healthcare. Yet we know that actually the first 500 uh, pounds per head spent on healthcare produces a lot of benefit with simple vaccines and antibiotics and such like. But as you go on, you know, you get very little extra value as you spend more money. And as Alan Entover, the American economist, argues, you probably reach a point where it begins to go down. So you put in more resources and you actually have less effect. So my ultimate argument is I think most doctors are medical nihilists, but most patients and citizens and politicians aren't. So I hope they will all read Jacob's book and be convinced. Thank you. I'm going to invite Jacob and Richard. There are three glasses but two chairs. That's a philosophical question. <laughs> so if you'd like to sit at the table. Yeah. Uh, we have roving microphones. Uh, Sherry's holding one. Is there one? Is there another one at the back? The other is yeah. terrific. Um, and so now it's your opportunity to comment. I assumed that we were going to have a balanced debate. We don't. We've got two medical nihilists in the front here. <laughs> uh, I am not one of them, so I may find that sort of compelled to say something at some point. But let me start by inviting uh, people in the audience to pose a question or make a comment uh, or challenge what's been said. Gentlemen, towards the back. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I was just wondering, at what point do you actually just think that we have just been getting these drugs that are, have ne well, which now have like very little benefit? Like you recently, say that a more at what point did you do you think that we now have these drugs that have very little benefit for us? At when do you think? we have got drugs that have very little benefits for us. When? When? Like, within the last how many years? I, I don't see it quite as when. I mean, you, I think you're thinking, well, we, did, we had very few effective drugs, then we had the kind of revolution that produced antibiotics, etc., penicillin, and now we're into a, and then we had, there was a, certainly in the 70s and 80s, there were quite a lot of significant drugs that had a big effect on things that were otherwise perhaps untreatable. But if you look at what's happened with the pharmaceutical industry since then, it seems to have largely kind of dried up. As Jacob said, a lot of them are me too's. There are very few drugs that have the sort of blockbuster effect of the past. And now, of course, there's a huge investment in biologicals, you know, as we uh, unravel the genetic code, we hope that this increased understanding will produce uh, new benefits. But I think what we mostly tend to see is extraordinarily expensive drugs, uh, particularly in oncology, that have really a very small effect on a very f small number of people. And then if we look at something like Alzheimer's, you see yesterday that, you know, a drug that looked terribly promising has turned out to be useless. And I think perhaps the whole uh, way we're thinking about Alzheimer's is wrong. But I mean, I suppose there is at least the possibility that something highly significant will come along sometime in the future, although we've been waiting a long time. Thank you for the very insightful talk. I'm, I'm just wondering, one of the objections that you, that you put on the last slide, you said that some of these drugs work for, for example, some of these drugs work for my friend. And the thing is, as you pointed out, there's um, some of the diseases that we're now targeting, they are really very complicated pathways. So um, how, I, I'm just wondering, relating this to the idea that certain drugs are starting to become more and more effective on very specific kind of genetics, does that actually uh, contribute to this um, phenomena? This is a, a very good question, and, and there's a lot packed into this question. So one, one possible rejoinder to the sort of skepticism that I've been articulating tonight is, OK, we test, we've been testing drugs in really coarse-grained reference classes 
And if we can appeal to better biologic knowledge, say um, genomic type knowledge, to refine our reference classes, um, then we will see larger effect sizes. Um, and so this is the promise of personalized medicine. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that. So there are, there are some very compelling cases of this in the history of medicine and in recent medicine. Um, so I wouldn't want to just say, you know, that that's uh, uh, sort of an unpromising way to go. Um, but but with, with respect to the appeal to first-person anecdote, so many, many of us reason by appeal to first-person anecdote, and again, one of the things that we sort of learned in 20th century medical research is that we should be cautious of appealing to first-person anecdote when assessing the causal efficacy of interventions because, you know, we, we, ha we suffer from confirmation bias, which is exacerbated by the placebo effect, which itself is ex exacerbated by the course of disease. Um, so appealing to first-person anecdote is dubious, um, but there is this promise for a kind of more scientific approach to testing interventions. Could I make a point? Well, Gentlemen of the purple jumper. You mentioned in answer to the first question that uh, a great many modern introduced drugs have a <coughs> small effect on a small number of, for a small number, relatively small effect for a small number of people. Do you think we're actually just looking in the wrong places, that there are lots of magic bullets to be found, but the economic forces mean that they're not being looked for because they will have a large effect on a large number of people who can't pay for them? First, I mean, uh, I w I'm one of the things I do these days, I'm the chair of the board of ICDDRB, which is the International Center for Daryl Disease Research in Bangladesh. And there are certainly, you know, it's one of the, I would say, one of the modern kind of iniquities of medicine that North America, for example, has 2% of the global burden of disease, but 25% of the uh, health workforce. And of course, it's the opposite way around in Africa. So I think there are, yes, there are plenty of conditions where the development of vaccines or new drugs could be highly beneficial for those people. And of course, there are initiatives like Gavi and such like attempting to respond to that. But generally, the economic forces are working you know, to producing treatments for female sexual dysfunction and diseases that don't even exist necessarily. And then I think the sheer economics of, you know, just a very few people benefiting from a very expensive drug, I mean, how on earth is that going to play out within a whole health system like the NHS? I mean, the worry is it's going to bankrupt it. I think, I think the question is very well motivated. So uh, even if we take the kind of poster child counterexamples to my thesis, it, so Gleevec example, is a drug that many people point to to say, look, here's a new magic bullet. It's been developed in the last generation. It's highly effective for disease leukemia. I had CML. I would take Gleevec for sure. It saves lives. But it costs $100,000 a year. Um, and, you know, that could save uh, 500 lives a year. Uh, where? Yeah. Okay, um, it, you, you've mentioned several times oncology, and if you look, for example, at life expectancy of lung cancers, they've barely increased over 20, 30, 40 years. But in some cancers, the, the outlook has improved a lot. And in many cases, it's slow incremental improvements over time. So if, if I were not a nihilist, I would argue actually it's necessary to have these small incremental increases. And in many cases, they do result in a real and important improvement. And actually, I'm not talking about monoclonals. I'm talking about drugs that are a lot cheaper. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I mean, we shouldn't be talking just about drugs because I agree with you that they're all, you know, there are, there are certainly examples of childhood cancer where things are way better now than they were 20, 
25 years ago, and a lot of that is not just down to drugs, it's, it's a whole series of interventions. But, um, and you know, certainly lots of improvements in treatment of rheumatoid arthritis or whatever. But I think in some ways, the, and I don't think, I mean, we, we're, not, we're not arguing, you know, let's close down medicine, let's get rid of the NHS. We're not going, well, certainly I'm not going so far with my medical nihilism. Uh, and I wonder whether you agree with the idea that actually a lot of doctors are themselves very sceptical of a lot of new treatments and, you know, are just are unconvinced by a lot of these benefits. So there's certainly examples of where we've made a lot of progress. And then as you started your conversation, there are, there are lots of examples where we've made remarkably little progress. And I would think particularly of dementia. Yeah, the lady back. Hello. Um, sorry, I realise my question might not belong here, but given the photo on the flyer, what, I'd be quite interested to hear your view on homeopathic remedies. <laughs> I mean, my own view, for, for what it's worth, is that the methodological and theoretical arguments that I appeal to uh, to generate skeptic a sceptical view about mainstream medicine apply even stronger to uh, homeopathic remedies. Um, arguably, most homeopathic remedies are less toxic than most of the contemporary pharmaceuticals. So you might say, at the very least, they're causing um, less harm. But the issues are actually quite subtle. So when I you know, talk about the evidence for the low effecti effectiveness of antidepressants, the, the more subtle story is that both SSRIs and placebo decrease your HAMD score by quite a lot. So it's just the difference between SSRIs and placebo, which is small. So you might say, well, actually, SSRIs are quite effective. They decrease your HAMD score by 10 points. It's just that the vast majority of the causal efficacy is placebo. And so if you go down that route, then you might say, well, why don't we figure out other ways to elicit placebo response? And you, you, you might think that homeopathy is one such way. Um, I think that's a pretty modest position. But I, I was going to make a rather s similar point. I mean, th this idea that you've probably heard as doctor's drug, you know, actually simply a caring doctor who talks to you, listens to you, can have enormous benefits. And when I think about, you know, there were 60 million prescriptions last year in this country for antidepressants. And as Jacob says, the evidence suggests that in mild depression, the placebo effect is just as powerful. You know, you get the same effect with the drug. So actually, you could argue better in a way for people to be chatting to friendly homeopaths and feeling good than taking uh, antidepressants that are ineffective and, of course, have side effects. We're getting close to running out of time. Um, so we'll take two more. That one at the back, and then, oh my God. <laughs> okay, you win. Uh, take one at the back, anyhow. Um, so from what you just said, um, that it may be better to still have kind of ways of eliciting placebo effects. Um, you said that you thought that most doctors were in some sense nihilist, but most patients or the general population aren't. Um, would you argue that it's better to kind of elicit a more nihilist response in the majority of the population at the risk of maybe reducing the placebo effect that they'd have from medicines that didn't work? I don't know that it would necessarily reduce the placebo effect. I mean, I, I do believe that more nihilism amongst the public could be very beneficial in all sorts of ways. I mean, one of the things I, I mean, imagine that if you have meningitis, then you know, what the doctors do will determine whether you live or die. If you have diabetes or all of the chronic conditions, which are most of today's medical problems, it's not down to the doctors and the nurses, it's down to you that will determine how well you do. So I think moving away from this idea that doctors have remarkable powers and recognizing that you as the patient must take responsibility for these things, which I think is a version of nihilism, 
I think would be thoroughly beneficial, and I think we could have a much more rational, sensible NHS if the public was more sceptical of the benefits of modern medicine. I think we'll take the final question here. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, um, did you use this acquisition uh, just to make your points to illustrate your arguments? Because someone may argue that you used pooled data for uh, the acquisition and if you use it for a specific intervention, the results would be different. Just repeat that once, please. So, so I was wondering, you, you used this acquisition um, and you used pooled uh, data in terms of um, the whole medicine, the whole interventions uh, in all uh, disciplines and whatever. If you use this acquisition for a specific intervention, for a specific medication, for a specific illness, then your results m might be different. Right, yeah, thanks. So just, just very briefly, um, I want to just clarify that I'm not offering an empirical argument, right? So if I, if I were offering an empirical argument, it would be a very weak argument indeed, right? Because I would have to survey, you know, uh, the, the, the thousands of interventions point. that are available. So I appeal to a handful of examples merely to illustrate um, my arguments. And those examples were carefully chosen. I mean, they were cherry-picked, if you will. But they were chosen because they were from classes of interventions that are among the most widely used interventions today, the statins, SSRIs, oncology drugs. So th these, are, these are the blockbusters by almost any metric of interventions. So, so those were illustrative examples. Um, but the argument is more of a principled argument. Of course, of course, though, I think your point is exactly right, that, um, that zooming in on particular domains um, s or even particular interventions would um, give you more or less reasons for optimism or pessimism. Absolutely. Okay. So before I just make a couple of remarks, I'm just curious to know how many people here are medical students? Would you raise your hand if you're a medical student? Okay. And how many people here are medical practitioners of one sort or another? Huh? Okay. What about philosophers? I assume the rest are philosophers. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're a vet. How many people are philosophers, students, philosophers, students, or something? Okay. That's a good mix. It's a good mix. Yeah. Okay. So I enjoyed this evening very much. Uh, can I just offer a slightly different perspective? Um, I would describe myself as a medical skeptic. I think that's a much better word. Nihilism. I think it has something to do with nothing. And if your implication is that we're engaged in medical nothingness, then that really, I find that very uh, jarring with the reality. So what I would absolutely agree with both of you about is that, well, certainly fraudulent trials must, people should be put in jail. Badly designed trials should be ignored. Trials even that are well designed need to be repeated before you trust the data. Uh, where there's bias, then that needs to be exposed. Publication bias, I absolutely accept, uh, happens as something we need to be skeptical about. But having said all of that, um, but then a lot of your examples, Jacob, were from mental health. Mental health is a very unsatisfactory area. We haven't had any really satisfactory new drug in mental health for about three decades. And it's extremely difficult, and uh, let's hope that that will change. So I think you, I'm with most of your remarks in relation to mental health. But if you look at other domains of medicine uh, in the last couple of decades, there are many transformative discoveries. Take what's, how we manage coronary artery disease with dry using stents. It has transformed people with coronary artery disease. And in fact, cardiac surgeons are almost going out of business because it's so effective. Thrombolysis in stroke has transformed the management of stroke. When I was a medical student, if a patient came in with an evolving stroke, you said, well, that's it. You, know, you just watch it happen, and the patient then has a very bad stroke with a big deficit. Now, if you intervene quickly, uh, life is very different. Cancer, I think you've been a little bit harsh on cancer. I'm an immunologist. Cancer immunotherapy is transforming some cancers that were untreatable into those that are treatable. You can live now with Hodgkin's disease, probably an almost like normal life expectancy. So a huge advance, I would say, in, in oncology. Rheumatoid arthritis transformed by anti-TNF. Uh, you ask the patient, uh, you don't need to do a trial, they'll tell you, my life is transformed. Transplantation in my own field. Again, it's a life-saving intervention. So I think, just for those of you that are in the business of medicine, I would hate you to go to bed tonight thinking, my gosh, you know, I'm, commi I'm committing myself to a life of misery and uselessness. I think, I think we're living in a medical revolution, which is extremely exciting. 
But we do need to approach it with a very, very healthy dose of sort and scepticism. And we absolutely need to be intolerant and critical of bad trials uh, over claiming uh, for their results. So I don't know whether I've allowed the last word. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to give a slightly different perspective on what I think is a very important debate. Now, my last task is to invite you the most important thing of all. There is refreshment and alcohol. You said something about alcohol, Richard. You're not alcohol. There's alcohol outside. You deserve a drink, and especially our speakers. Could you please thank them very much?